and welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show that listens to its audience. It just takes a really, really, really long time sometimes. So, what I'd like to do today is I'd like to address something that I've been asked about a lot by viewers, and almost since day one. And that is, how do I transfer all the videos and records and stuff that I discuss on the archive? So, what I've done here, and uh, out of character and Ed Free no less, is over the last couple of days, I've just gone around camcorder and or screen capture software in tow, and I've tried to give a good glimpse into all the most common transfer jobs that I do, usually for archive. And so, with that, I guess, uh, let's get started with about as close to a real behind the scenes as I've ever gotten around here. All right, here we go. Full-on guerrilla style, autofocus, auto everything, no special microphone, just raw camcorder stuff. And this will be a very long segment, I'll tell you right now, because I'm going to try and hit several birds with one stone here. Anyway, uh, what you're seeing here are the two most common ingredients to my video transfers. So let's start with the top here. And what we got here is a Sony Digital 8 Handycam from about 2002. And this belonged to my parents. And they were going to throw this out. And I said, no, 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 I'll, I'll take it. Uh, because I didn't own a camcorder at all. So for me, it was just like, hey, free camcorder. But um, anyway, the great thing about this that I found out, I'd already had it for a few years, was that you can use these as a pass-through, a, a lot of these later tape-based camcorders anyway. And the reason for that is a lot of these later Digital 8 and Mini DV camcorders have computer interfaces. So FireWire or USB, uh, this one's FireWire, and uh, unfortunately FireWire seems to be going away. I don't know if I like that. Uh, but I do have a mini DV camcorder with a USB interface. But anyway, um, let's take a closer look at this and I'll show you how you can use a lot of these things as a pass through. Let's start with uh, the plugs here. So, what we've got here are most importantly, well, of course, you got the uh, interface down there, in this case, again, FireWire. But these are the two most important ones. So S-Video, and uh, operative word, video, no audio. And then uh, this, for you can use it for just audio, or you can use audio and video at once. So um, invariably, people, especially if they only have much lower end equipment, It'll be using what I call a Y and a half cable, which is eighth inch male on one side, and then composite video and audio on the other, the three plugs, the uh, red, white, and yellow. But you can use this, of course, with S-Video and then just a Y cable or not using all three plugs with one of those, uh, as I call them, Y and a half cables. So you got that. And you can use, on this model at least, you can use these as input or output. And I've had to do it both ways. I mean, uh, when I have to reverse engineer something, so I'm going from what started as a computer file on down to, for example, VHS. I've had to switch this around. So uh, there you go. Let me show you how to dig into the pass-through. Of course, your mileage may actually probably will vary. Hopefully there's enough battery power on here. So usually in the menu, there's something called AVDV out or something like that. And of course you'll want it to be engaged. That's where you find it. And it basically means that it'll accept something. Uh, of course, again, your mileage may vary. And of course, uh, this one has like a, a built-in time-based corrector and stuff, which is half useful. 
hi-fi sound, all that great stuff. But anyway, sometimes there's other little things that you'll have to access in there to do what you need. So maybe it's an input of some sort. So that's how you find that stuff. Now, let me get that back in the shot. There are some downsides to this, but I, I personally consider the pros to way outweigh the cons here. And I do have an alternate method of capturing video, but this is the one I normally use. But um, let, let's start with the downside of this. So you're using this and you're passing it on to the computer, and this is straight up raw, uncompressed footage. And that's a memory hog. So you're looking at basically one gigabyte of space for five minutes of video. It, actually, slightly less. I think it's 457 or something. But So you've got that going against you. But on the plus side, it's pure. There's no interlacing, which I'll show you some of that sort of stuff later. Um, you know, it's pretty much just ready to use, maybe process just a little bit. And it does the best job at ret retaining the flavor of whatever format you're pulling from. Now, there's another great upside to these things, and that is, and I'm not trying to encourage piracy here, but uh, it will bypass Macrovision, and that's because Macrovision copy protection generally only engages when it senses something trying to record. But if you're running, a, say, a videotape that has Macrovision onto this, as far as it's concerned, if you're not actually recording onto a tape in the camcorder, it thinks it's just a monitor, like you've just hooked it up to the TV. So it doesn't engage. So when you do that and you're passing it onto the computer, the Macrovision never ca catches on. And... Again, I'm not trying to promote piracy, but, you know, say you've got that old VHS favorite that's never made it to DVD and probably never will, or uh, sometimes with Archive. Like, uh, very recently I riffed part of a video uh, hosted by Vincent Price in which he was teaching you how to use a 3D camera. Believe it or not, that thing had Macrovision. It's never going to get reissued. The company that made it went under a long time ago, but, you know, sometimes you have to think about that stuff and, you know, play Mr. Preservation Pirate with that sort of stuff. But again, um, you know, if you're just copying a copy of Toy Story or something, that's kind of stupid. Anyway, uh, let's look at the other main ingredient of this whole uh, ball of craziness. And more often than not, certainly for me, that is a VCR. And what we've got here is a, a very common VCR. I've seen a bunch of these in thrift stores over the years. But this is a quasi-SVHS unit in that it'll play back SVHS tapes and it outputs an S-video signal if you want it to. Um, but it won't record that stuff. So it's not really a, a true SVHS unit. But again, the if you're just transferring, you know, you can you take whatever you can get. So anyway, uh, of course, uh, as I'm sure you know, SVHS does not preclude you from playing a standard old VHS tape. And so, yeah, this works great. And I've actually been through another SVHS unit, a real SVHS unit, and the thing just kept screwing up the audio and stuff. And so, believe it or not, this little low-end unit remains the champ. And uh, the only real annoyance with this thing is um, it's automatic tracking on this, which you can disable. But uh, I generally don't do that. But when it kicks in, it'll start flashing the words video calibration on screen. But you can d bypass that, too, if you dig into the menu. And a nice thing about these is they work very, very nicely with universal remotes if you don't have the original remote. And so you can turn all that off and you can just worry about getting a clean, uninterrupted batch of footage. But uh, another great thing about a VCR is that 
you can use it for more than just VHS. So let me turn this around here. And let me try and focus. Zoom in, all that good stuff. So what we got here is mostly outputs. We've got the SVHS, or S-Video rather, output. And uh, composite, audio and video out. And then you've got the two coax jacks, one input, one output. And here's where, again, you can start using this for things more than just VHS. So a very easy example is early video game footage. So like an Atari 2600. If you've ever dealt with a 2600, the plug on the end, TV plug, is a phono plug. And that's one plug for everything. And uh, you're not going to have a whole lot of luck using this with much of anything, are you? So that's where you have to make a little bit of an investment. And I bought a bunch of these things. Uh, these little adapters. Come on, camera focus. And this particular one is phono female on one end and then coax mail on the other. And you can just stick it on and plug in. And you can run from the, uh, again, using Atari as an example, from the Atari into here, and you can pass it on to whatever you're trying to record to. And uh, I have a bunch of these also that are the inverse, because some consoles... Oh, come on, camera. Yeah, it's not really playing nice today. Um, I've got some of these where it's phono mail on one end and uh, all variations on this. So I can go from pretty much any old school pre-NES console. I guess this would include the NES too, come to think of it. And uh, yeah, so that's how I do it. And you get a nice picture with these things. And uh, I said you make an investment. It's not much of an investment. Uh, these things are on eBay and they're usually between 2 and $3 a pop. So you can buy a bunch of them for, say, 20 bucks. Just get a, an assortment. Now, uh, Let's talk about Laserdiscs real quickly. Uh, there are Laserdisc players with S-Video outputs, but the thing about Laserdisc is they were recorded using composite video. So S-Video really doesn't matter all that much. So you, sometimes you might see it and you might see somebody trying to coax some insane amount of money for a Laserdisc player with S-Video output. And let me tell you, it's it's pretty much meaningless, so it's don't even worry about it. Anyway, um, my other main method of capturing video is with this DVD recorder, which I did a Ben's Junk on pretty recently. And I'm not going to get really into any great depth here, but it's got all the same inputs pretty much it also has a component output on it uh, the coax stuff doesn't work though but uh, I will use this unit more for um, when I need a lot of footage like uh, video game footage when I'm trying to achieve a winning game of something and I just need more time and space and I can't be sitting there worrying about my hard drive and uh, the downside with this is you get interlaced footage so you have to worry about deinterlacing and uh, so you get to fidget around with that a bit but I'll show you how I take care of that in the next segment which I think we're just about ready for actually because I think pretty much anything else I have to say about my video transfers is going to be better served by clips and from just footage from the computer itself. So let's take a look at that. Alright, here I go with just the built-in microphone on the computer and uh, I'll try and give you a, a little rundown on how I take care of stuff from the DVD recorder, which means having to rip the DVDs. And what I have learned, silly me, my initial thought was, because DVD footage is, I think, always interlaced, I'm not positive, uh, that it's something you would want to take care of after the fact, uh, you know, once you've got the rip. But what I found is you can do it 
as part of the initial rip and it gets you much, much better results. So I've got Handbrake open here and this is just uh, shareware and it works for Windows and Mac and I think Linux as well. So this should apply to any platform and uh, any modern platform. <laughs> Commodore users might be out of luck here. But anyway, I've got Handbrake open and I've got a DVD of some VHS footage that I took a while ago. There's only about 20 or 30 minutes of footage on here. so. Let me go ahead and stick this in the machine, and it could very well take a while for it to read. Uh, there might have to be some editing done within this segment, and uh, actually I know there will, because when it finally gets down to the actual DVD ripping, it's basically going to take half the running time of whatever you're trying to rip. So say you have an hour of footage that you're trying to take care of. Uh, then, let me close that DVD player, uh, then it'll take you half an hour. So anyway, we got the DVD loaded, as I'm sure you just saw. So here in Handbrake, you will go to Source, and it's already taking me where I want to, but you'll find the disc that you stuck in the machine, and you just pick the whole folder. So in this case, I can just double-click this entire DVD folder and this doesn't really seem to matter. I just say attempt scan anyway, and it'll do its thing. It does take a bit, but again, this is a, not a whole lot of footage on here, so hopefully it won't take too long. And uh, annoyingly, Handbrake likes to do stuff for you sometimes, and the big problem I have when I'm trying to rip something that I've recorded is Handbrake will try and crop the picture. And honestly, I don't mind if I even have a little bit of a black box around the picture. I just don't like stuff getting cut off. Um, again, that's just my personal preference. Your mileage may vary. But anyway, it looks like it's read the disc here, and it'll give you a drop-down list of titles. So I've only got two to choose from here. I guess uh, we'll take the long one. And then it's got a destination folder here. Uh, here it defaults to desktop, which is fine for me, but uh, I want to give it a different name. So this will still just go to the desktop, but I'll just call it uh, DVD Rip Test. Anyway, as I was saying, uh, Handbrake likes to try and crop the picture on you a lot of times, so you'll see it here, picture cropping, and it'll have all these odd numbers here. Amazingly, this time it's not trying to crop but to keep it from doing that, and you'll have to do this with every disc, you'll go into picture settings here, and let me get this in the shot. Uh, it'll default to the size menu, and you'll go to here where it says cropping, and you'll select custom, and invariably there'll be all these wacky numbers all over the place, but you'll just want to take them down using the arrow keys to zero. Unfortunately, you can't just, you know, highlight it and type it. That would be nice but uh, it's not really a thing yet. Uh, anyway, so we're good on that front. And then for the deinterlacing, you pick filters here. So we were on size, now we're on filters. And you got this little switch here between decomb and deinterlace. You'll want deinterlace. This magically just became a deinterlace uh, drop-down menu. You'll want slower, which will get you the best result. And we're good to go. So we can X out of that. We got everything all ready to go, and we hit start. And like I said, it takes about half as long uh, as the actual runtime of whatever you're working on for this to happen. So this is probably going to be about a 10-minute rip. But uh, there we go. It's getting started slowly but surely. And again, my estimate's about 10 minutes for this. Let's see. Yeah, that's about right. Okay, so now I wait. Uh, you don't have to. And there we are. So let's open up the file that it gave me, if I can find it. Let's see here. There it is. And 
Let's see what we get here. There's one commercial in particular that I have struggled with, and if you've seen the Ben's junk that I did on that thing, uh, let me take the disc out first. Since I'm thinking of it, oh, hi Phil Hartman, we miss you. There's one add in here that I used over and over again in that episode because it was just nothing but a problem. So let's see how the motion shots turned out in this one. And let's see if I can't make this just a teeny bit bigger. Again, what you're hearing is just the sound from this feeding back into the microphone. That's good. Normally when he turns his head, it's not very good. Yeah, this came out pretty good. Nice. All right, so that's how I take care of the DVD basic rip stuff. Um, sometimes I'll have to go back and maybe the picture will be really dark and I'll have to brighten it up a bit later on. Uh, sometimes it'll have a really weak sound or sound just out of one channel and then I have to slice and dice the audio, sometimes resync the audio. Uh, but generally that doesn't happen. Um, if it's my own footage, usually I have tried to factor that in ahead of time. Next on Fox. Somalia. Harold. Somalia. Harold. Some breeds. Uh uh. Sit. Oh. Honey, that was a Plymouth Voyager. Voyager. I think I can pretty safely say that I struggle more with the audio related stuff that I have to do for archive. And I know that sounds just totally counterintuitive because you think, oh, it's just going straight from vinyl or cassette or whatever to this CD burner and that's that. It's just magic. But it's not. And a big part, if not the big part of dealing with audio stuff is all the artifacting in analog audio, so especially vinyl. So um, let me try and give a few little tips and stuff on how I tackle this stuff. Uh, actually, before I get to that, this is, again, just a standard straight uh, audio CD burner, obviously. And it's uh, the signal flow is as basic as it can get. It's just 
turntable or cassette or what have you going straight into the deck and then I record and you know you adjust the recording level accordingly so yeah certainly from a signal flow standpoint it's a lot easier but it's again you're just dealing with all those little idiosyncrasies of audio so um, the first big thing is just for me getting a straight clean uninterrupted transfer of the record or tape or whatever and then I go back and worry about um, trying to work on the sound and cut it down into individual tracks and all that sort of stuff and uh, thankfully this particular unit will accept rewritables now, unfortunately these music ones are getting harder to come by but um, you know so if I screw up or something goes wrong which is nine times out of ten I can just erase it and start again and I don't have to burn through a whole stack of discs now it, the only time that the transfer work gets a little more complicated going just into this CD burner for that initial rough transfer is when it's something like uh, the talking house transmitter or uh, when I did the what was it the shortwave radio episode a couple of years ago and I just had that little handheld deal and so I just went out of the for example with that I just went out of the headphone jack with that with a Y cable and then into the burner so I mean that's about as complicated uh, signal wise as it gets for the initial stuff the heavy stuff comes later and since I'm here and I've got the camera going and everything let's just take a quick look at my basic stuff so uh, just below the burner is the uh, receiver for my overall stereo system and this pretty much only gets used when I'm trying to get off-air radio stuff but uh, a basic CD player which I don't really need for transferring now over the summer my old cassette deck died on me so uh, this is the replacement and this is an MCS and uh, that was the house brand of JC Penney's and I have very very good reason to believe that this was a rebranded Technics brand tape deck and it's probably from about 1985 and I really like this one. Um, I actually like it a lot better than my old deck. Um, a lot less flutter, so the tape plays at a, just a more constant uh, rate, you know, instead of kind of fluttering around. You know, they call it flutter for a reason. You just kind of hear, especially in the high frequencies, things kind of drooping around and all that. But I also really like that everything on this is manual. So I can switch between types of tape, um, so type 1, type 2, and type 4. Although invariably, a little trade secret, I'll, even if it's, say, a type 2 tape, I'll do the initial transfer with uh, the normal type 1 setting, and then I can go back and filter the audio to my own tastes. And then uh, you can turn the Dolby on and off, and then you uh, have a couple of built-in mic inputs for stereo recording complete with a left and right knob and you can record from mic or from line just very simple stuff and then the turntable that we've all seen a million times on archive this is the same one that I use to transfer and another little secret when I do record ripoffs or something and you're seeing this particular you know turntable going around in the record playing what you're actually hearing is my final transfer and I've just gone back and I've synced it up so I take some camcorder footage of that particular point in whatever song that I'm playing and then I go back and resync it so yeah I, I'm sure a lot of people figured that out already anyway uh, and then lastly the 8 track deck which is uh, it's finicky but it works um, I have it set so the screws don't even live in there anymore I just I have it so I can just pull this front cabinet out and I can deal with the main circuit board here because the circuit board for whatever reason it has to sit just right and sometimes you have to uh, wake it back up into properly playing the audio so I, I am kind of on the hunt for a little better 8 track deck but it, it's not too terrible it's a when it works it's pretty solid so 
yeah. All right, let's get over to the computer and we'll try and take a look at how I do the processing and how some of the stuff sounds when it's just raw and how I get to that final product and all that good stuff. Okay, we are in Audacity right now, which is another shareware program. And nine times out of ten, this is where I do basically all the proper editing for any audio that I'm working on. If it's really bad, I have to take it to Pro Tools. But let's see if I can get through this. And I've got two uh, tracks here, and they've both been used on Archive before, but I had to go back and take new raw transfers of them. And the top one here is uh, the Rocky Mountain Professional Photographers Association board meeting from the Random Audio Cassettes episode, and I only took the first five minutes or so of it. And at the bottom here is a one of the ones from Record Ripoffs, and it's a rendition of Don't Expect Me to Be Your Friend, originally by Lobo. And uh, this is the one that somebody put their cigarette, up, cigarette out on. So I'm going to basically just walk you through my usual process. Uh, the cassettes are usually a little easier, so we'll start with that. We'll mute this. But usually what I'll do is I'll cut any dead space off the beginning and end of uh, a, a chunk of audio. Uh, as I mentioned, I like to take a whole side of a record or a whole side of a tape at once, and then I'll... Uh, I guess you could say stitch it back together, but I, usually it's me, as I said, working with entire chunks of audio at once. So like here at the bottom, this would normally be the whole side of the record and I would just work on it all the way through. So anyway, let's start with this. Now, when I am starting a side, I usually leave, uh, two-fifths to half a second of lead time at the beginning. So we'll take the beginning right here at five and a half and give it a little over a tenth of a second of a fade in from the effects menu. And that's usually the start. I did not have one of my extra ears. And it's very quiet right now. And I do that on purpose, actually, because, let me go back to full screen here, um, invariably, uh, probably the vinyl would be a better descriptor. You see all these spikes here? This, it's all artifacting. These are all pops and stuff from the vinyl. So I usually deliberately record it at a fairly low volume because it makes the spikes stand out more and then once I at least give them something manageable then I can go back and I have that much more room to work on when I turn it up to where it would normally peak at a full zero dB. So anyway, uh, back to the cassette. Usually my first thing that I'll do is I'll amplify it again from the effects menu. So I've got over 11 dB worth of headroom there. And this takes a few seconds. Of course, it takes a lot longer if I deal with a whole side of something. So this brought it up to full volume, and listening's not going to do a whole lot of good because you can only hear what's leaking from my speakers back into the microphone. We did not have one last year, and I got a lot of comments. As a matter of fact, it's quiet. Now, it's uh, really crackly, really bad. It's an amateur recording, so you just have to know, with a lot of the stuff I work with, just realistically, it's never going to sound all that great. But here's what I usually do. So, normally, I will filter the audio pretty conservatively. So, let's start with a uh, low-pass filter, which allows low frequencies to continue to pass through. Normally I will take the most steep roll off it'll let me have and I'll put the cutoff at 20 kilohertz or 20,000 hertz. So we got that. This should let uh, everything below 20k stay and everything above 20k go bye bye. 
and the sampling rate is for my method 44.1 kilohertz uh, Nyquist theorem all that wonderful stuff it comes out to 22.05 so I'll, I can get up to 22,050 hertz and a lot of that is really just the human ear doesn't really hear it that well but when I cut it off, it makes it seem a little clearer. So let's take a as much of a listen as we can at the cutoff at 20k for starters. Uh, actually, you know, let me just finish this. I also do a high pass, uh, very gentle. I don't like cutting off too much low end, so it's only 25 hertz usually. And there we go. Let's listen a little. It's not too bad. Let's take it down to 19K. I usually won't do it below 18 or 19K because uh, I don't like sacrificing much of the music or verbiage in this case. So let's see what 19 brought us down to, which again... As best as I can tell, that's better. All right, and usually when you cut it off, it also takes uh, the level down slightly, so I usually have a little more headroom, and I do. I have uh, 1.4 dB. So I can take that up. And in the case of something like this, it's really variable in sound quality. And I again, I do tend to strive for a, a good amount of purity. But when it's something like this, where it's not musical, sometimes I will take this into Pro Tools and compress the sound to try and level out all this so we don't have such big spikes here. But yeah, for starters, anyway. Now, the vinyl's always much more of a problem. So I'll usually just take an initial click removal pass at it, and I have it set usually at about a third this away and a little under half on this. So about a third for threshold and a little under half for spike width. And it never gets rid of everything, but I found when I set it more sensitive, it really <laughs> makes problems. So anyway, you can see that it took care of a lot of the problems here, but you can see also where that person put their cigarette out on it. But anyway, let's amplify this up to zero. And normally with this kind of stuff, I mean, this is a very extreme case, but if I can't do anything about it, I will have to literally go in and cut out that section. So, hopefully you could hear that nice thud. And I really don't like having to sacrifice audio. I'm doing great today. But you just don't get a choice sometimes. So, let's... see if it's too noticeable if I cut out just the most nasty part. You'll see there's still a bit of a spike if I go the right direction in zooming out. Let's see what it did. A memory. Thinking of so in comparison it's not too bad. A memory. Just sounds like a general pop. Okay, now imagine having to do that for the whole side of a record. And uh, when I'm done, of course, uh, amplifying it back and sometimes having to dump it into Pro Tools. And since I've got it out, I guess I'll have to dump something into Pro Tools just so you know what I do. But I'll also throw in in this segment some compare and contrast for you of the raw audio and what the finished product sounds like. But this is the basic, very tedious gist of it.
thinking of you jumbles up my mind. I got the same thing at Omaha. Jack Nathans was the first one to hit me. Now, if Jack will go to Beacon and we'll go to Omaha, I got the same thing at Omaha. Jack Nathans was the first one to hit me. Now, if Jack will go to Beacon and we'll go to Omaha to get a breakfast, uh, and won't come to Rocky Mountain because he didn't get a breakfast. Uh, that's well, that's I, Jack. I, I, I use that. I, you got to know Jack. Me. Yeah. Well, I got the same thing at Omaha. Jack Mason was the first one to hit me. Now, if Jack will go to Beacon and we'll go to Omaha to get a breakfast, uh, and won't come to Rocky Mountain because he didn't get a breakfast. Uh, oh, that's well. That's I, Jack. I, I, I use that. I, you got to know Jack. Me. Yeah. I got the same thing at. Omaha, Jack Mason was the first one to hit me. Now, if Jack will go to Beacon and we'll go to Omaha to get a breakfast, uh, and won't come to Rocky Mountain because he didn't get a breakfast. Oh, that's well. That's I, Jack. I, 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 I use that. I, you got to know Jack. Me. Yeah. Well, Isn't that so exciting? Yeah, I'm kind of hoping myself that this was the last of the how-to episodes I have to do for a while. Anyway, that's it for today's archive. Join us next time when the candid camcorder footage of me swearing up a storm and threatening my 8-track deck with major bodily harm just suddenly, magically, mysteriously surfaces. Much to never start like you. So let's just let the story down and end. I love you too much to never start like you.